Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, convening Yale lecture uh, in our series. I'm Sham Sundar uh, from Yale School of Management. Uh, as many of you may know, convening Yale is a lecture series at the School of Management where we invite our colleagues from across the Yale campus uh, to share the ideas and the scholarship uh, with the SOM and more broadly, the Yale community. And today we have a good fortune to have Professor David Blight of uh, Yale's Department of History and, hello, uh, Department of History and uh, uh, American Studies and African American Studies. He's also the director of Gilder Lerman uh, uh, Center for Study of Slavery, Resistance and Abolition. His, uh, his associations and accomplishments are uh, simply <laughs> too extensive for me to spend much time on. I'll take up too much of his time uh, of this session. But I should mention is he's a scholar of uh, history, uh, slavery, Frederick Douglass. He has written a number of books on that. His most recent book published just this year on Frederick Douglass, The Prophet of Freedom, that many of you may have read about. Uh, Maybe David will talk about that book and about Frederick Douglass. Uh, he has received more awards for his scholarship, his books, than most people get a chance, to, the articles or books to write in their whole careers. So I'm not gonna to try to count them. <laughs> and uh, he's also public intellectual who, uh, participate very actively in uh, many, many uh, public activities in the museums, in exhibitions, in, in advisory capacity to various commissions, films, and works of art. And uh, again, more than I can possibly count. Some of you probably saw his uh, op-ed piece about uh, Trumpism on the past Saturdays, New York Times is still on the website. If you, uh, and uh, his course, uh, his famous course on Civil War and Reconstruction Era is an open courses of Yale. Uh, and you are all welcome to <laughs> visit and take that course online if you wish. Uh, so I'm not going to take much more of your time and because I've requested David uh, to talk about his uh, most recent book on Frederick Douglass, about Frederick Douglass and slavery more generally, and if he wishes to comment on the recent events we have gone through the election and putting this election in the historical context which he's uniquely qualified to do. Thank you so much, David, for joining us. Would you please welcome David Bly? Well, <laughs> thank you, Sham and Marie Crane for helping organize all of this. Uh, it's extraordinary that as many of you would come on this beautiful Monday if you're here in New Haven. You should be out on a lunchtime walk right now and not listening to me in front of your screens, but since you are, uh, actually, Sean and I were talking just before this um, <laughs> about what to compare this election to. I want to get to Frederick Douglass for sure in, in just a moment. But uh, <laughs> the, this is not a disputed election, as you know, in the traditional sense of disputed elections. We've had at least four of those, 1824, when a bargain had to be kind of struck in the House of Representatives to make John Quincy Adams president in a four-way contest. 
there was 1876, the, the great disputed election uh, between Hayes and Tilden that ended in many months of, uh, of strife and eventually a compromise cut in a smoke-filled room in the Wormley Hotel in Washington, D.C. that made Hayes president, even though he probably did not win the popular vote. And then we had the year 2000, which many of us lived through, of course, uh, where the Supreme Court by five to four chose our president, though Albert Gore did, in all estimates, uh, win the popular vote. Uh, at any rate, uh, this one's not disputed in any real sense. Uh, we have an electoral college victor, uh, but the only time, Sham asked me, I mean, the only time, let's face it, we've ever had uh, a situation where the side that lost or the candidate that lost uh, in some form refused to accept the result. And that's not to suggest that is what uh, President Trump is doing right now. We don't know exactly where he's going to go in these next 70 days. Uh, but the only thing to really compare that to is 1860, unfortunately. And as you know, 1860 was more than a disputed election. It was the one time where the side that lost truly refused to accept the result. The secession of the South, the 11 deep South states uh, that became the Confederacy, occurred in direct response, at least the first seven occurred in direct response to the election of Abraham Lincoln, who lest we forget was elected by about 39% of the vote, a four way election. The country was uh, tremendously divided. Um, it divided not only into the two parties, uh, but two additional parties. Uh, the Democratic party split in two into two Democratic parties. And then a fourth party came into existence overnight called the Constitutional Union Party. Its sole purpose of which was to try to find some way to save the union, didn't work. It ended in secession. And then after the firing on Fort Sumter in April of 1861, it ended up in civil war. Now, let's all pray that's not where this is headed. And I don't think it is. Um, unless Mr. Trump goes out and tries to stoke some kind of social unrest and social rebellion among his huge flock of followers. Uh, we have to keep, keep uh, believing that there are sane voices, even in the Republican establishment, who will not let that happen. But there's been a lot of commentary in recent times, and I'm sure many of you have been reading it, uh, about where we find comparisons in our history to this. And I can tell you, uh, 60 Minutes, the CBS show, was planning a segment for last night on disputed elections. And they had actually asked me to be ready uh, the day after the election, along with, I think, some other, clearly some other historians and other people. They were going to do a whole show on the history of disputed elections, but this one did not end up disputed and they canceled that part of their show, which is, was good since we don't want that. Anyway, I'd be happy to come back to that in Q&A if someone wishes for sure, but let me transition quickly here to Douglas and just give you some quick sense of how this biography came about for me. I'll give you a little bit of the contours of the book uh, and a little bit of my biographer's dilemma in trying to capture this man's life. And I may say a few things about his politics, uh, which is one of the deepest threads and most interesting things about him, among others. Um, this book would not exist, though, and I have to uh, always uh, pay attention to this. It would not exist if I had not had the blind, crazy good luck of running into a very special private collection of Frederick Douglass manuscripts. This is one of these rare, crazy things that can happen to a scholar, and it happened to me. And it really was blind good luck. About 14 years ago, going on 15, I went to Savannah, Georgia, to give a talk to middle and high school teachers on Frederick Douglass's narrative, his first autobiography, which is now widely taught in schools. 
I had done my first book out of graduate school, a dissertation book on Douglas. I had edited editions of his first two autobiographies, et cetera. And as I arrived in Savannah, my host, the Georgia Historical Society's leader, said there's a local gentleman here in town. He's a collector and he'd like to meet and have lunch. And we did. His name is Walter Evans. And uh, a long story made short, Walter is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, uh, came north. He actually finished high school up in Hartford, Connecticut. But then he did his higher education at Howard University in DC and his medical school at the University of Michigan. And then Walter ended up practicing as a general surgeon in Detroit for almost 35 years, uh, which gave Walter and me a lot in common because I grew up in Flint, Michigan, just up the road. Anyway, he though had a lifetime passion or nearly a lifetime passion for African-American manuscripts, rare books, and art. He started collecting shortly after he became a surgeon. His art collection actually is far more valuable even than his manuscript collections. But that day in Savannah, he took me to his house, which is a big, beautiful brownstone in Savannah, if you're in, in any way familiar with that gorgeous Southern city. And uh, he got out on his dining room table portions of his Douglas collection. And it was extraordinary. But I have to say, I did not have some road to Damascus moment. I didn't decide on the spot. Oh my goodness, now I must do a full life of Douglas. In fact, I found that too daunting. It took me many months to actually decide. My agent got involved and she sort of decided for me. At any rate, what is so important about that collection and again, what makes this such a rare experience as a historian is that it is primarily about the last third of Douglas's life. The core of it are nine very large family scrapbooks. There are also a lot of other family letters and documents of various kinds, but those scrapbooks are a repository of thousands and thousands of newspaper clippings that the family kept over the last third of Douglas's life. Primarily it was kept by two of his sons. He had four surviving adult children. They all had a hand in these scrapbooks, but particularly two sons. And if Americans know Frederick Douglass, uh, until now at least, it, they, tend, they have tended to know him through the young Douglas, the one who wrote that first narrative. And people grow up now reading that narrative in school. It is the most famous of the slave narratives. They tend to know that young heroic Douglas who escaped from slavery when he's 20 years old. They know something maybe about his career as an orator because he took the abolitionist circuit by storm in the 1840s and then again in the 1850s. They might even know about him being a journalist, uh, published his own abolitionist newspaper for 16 years. But they don't know the older Douglas, the, the aging Douglas, uh, the patriarch Douglas, who had four surviving adult children, 21 grandchildren, and a variety of other fictive siblings and hangers on who were always around him. Uh, they, they don't tend to know this older man who some have often said kind of fell out of touch uh, was surpassed by the younger generation and became a political insider and so on and so on and so on. The truth is that older Douglas is absolutely fascinating, intriguing, complicated. And the Evans collection opened a window onto that part of Douglas's life, this greatest African-American leader of the 19th century and one of the greatest of all we've ever had. It opened up a window onto that latter part of Douglas's life. And that is why I did this book. And if any of you have it, you perhaps notice I dedicated the book to Walter and Linda Evans. They became my dear friends, my patrons. I spent at least five or six Yale spring breaks in Savannah working on their dining room table. Uh, it's the greatest archive I've ever worked on. 
And I worked there for days. They would let me stay into the night. Um, and the last point about that, uh, the good news is, as you may know, it's had a lot of publicity. Uh, it took years to negotiate this, but Walter finally agreed about a year ago to sell his Douglas collection to the Beinecke Library. Uh, he delivered it, believe it or not, he's an eccentric collector, like collectors tend to be. He delivered that collection in a rented van over here to Winchester Street to the Beinecke Lab late last February. And it has, <laughs> uh, and that night I took Ian Linda out to the Union League and we celebrated. And uh, he's a good businessman, by the way. They made him an offer at least five years ago uh, for his collection, which he turned down. And he waited until after the book came out. And uh, I'll just say the price virtually doubled. Uh, and God bless the, the leadership and curators at the Beinecke Library. They worked very hard with Walter to get him to do this. And it is now being completely digitized. In fact, I think the scrapbooks are already finished. And that entire digitized collection will be available, I believe, to the world by January. So, and in fact, next week, is it next week or the week after, the Beinecke is, is having a, a webinar uh, with Walter, me, uh, two curators at the Beinecke, all about that collection how it came about, how Walter collected it, what's in it, and so on. It, you might want to tune in. It, it should be interesting. And Walter knows what's, he knows what he collects. <laughs> I can tell you that. Anyway, that's why I did the book. Uh, but just a few thoughts about Mr. D. Um, Douglas is born a slave in 1818 in a backwater, frankly, of the American Slave Society out on the eastern shore of Maryland. He spends the first 20 years of his life as a slave. Uh, one of his many lucky breaks was that he was sent to Baltimore. He spent nine of those 20 years uh, in Baltimore, a city, a great maritime city, an ocean port, where he, he gained literacy, which was the most important thing to him. But he also lived in this world of the seaport. He worked in the shipyards. He worked in the docks. He learned to trade, caulking, among other things. He saw all these ships going in and out, the great clipper ships. And he lived amidst a very large free black community, which may seem to some like an, you know, an an incomprehensible anomaly, but in Baltimore, the year he escaped in 1838, he was among about 3,000 slaves in the city of Baltimore, but there was a free black population of almost 17,000. And it is in that population that he also lived and operated. He attended four different churches. He got involved in a debating society. He met Anna Murray, his soon to be first wife. He made associations and connections and opportunities to use his literacy. But Douglas is gonna live all the way to 1895. Uh, really his life traverses almost the whole trajectory of the 19th century. And he will become with absolutely no formal education, which was possible in America in the 19th century. Abraham Lincoln didn't have much formal education either. Uh, he will become the most important African-American person of letters uh, of all, and still one of our most important. And to understand Douglas, or even understand why we're, we're sitting here talking about him, you have to first see him through words. And I made words, his language, his writing, and his oratory, pretty much the central thread of the book. At one point, I wanted to call the book <laughs> Douglas, Frederick Douglass' Biography of a Voice. Now, my editor, Simon Schuster, who's a brilliant man, uh, Bob Bender, said, nope, can't have that title. Sounds too literary. You'll lose your audience. And he was probably right. But we know Douglass in his words. 
the, the numbers tell the tale. He wrote three autobiographies and even revised the third one into a fourth. The first one in 1845, the second one in 1855 called My Bondage and My Freedom, which is his long form masterpiece. The third one in 1881 called Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, which he revises again in 1892. This man never stopped telling his own story, which is a question I address in the book, trying to explain why. But he also wrote hundreds and hundreds of the shorter form political editorials in his newspaper from 1847 to 1863. And then again in a second newspaper that he published during Reconstruction called The New National Era, which lasted three years in Washington, DC. Then he wrote one novella in 1852 called The Heroic Slave and would that he had tried fiction a little more often. Although, <laughs> As some critics have said, his autobiographies have some great fiction, uh, as do all great autobiographies. And then there are the speeches, the thousands of speeches. Uh, this man was arguably the greatest orator of the 19th century. He had a few rivals, from Daniel Webster to even Mark Twain. But uh, it is in his speeches that we sometimes first encounter him, uh, from quotations or from people reading his 4th of July speech or one of the other classics. But I must tell you this, Douglas wasn't just an orator who could walk into a church or a hall and blow out the lights with flamboyant oratory. He could do that. He was a preacher early on, a trained preacher. But he wrote down every speech. Every major Douglas speech exists for us scholars in a text. Before the war, they tended to be all handwritten texts. And thank God he had beautiful handwriting. And so did his children. After the war, they tend to be in typescripts. This man was a writer. And above all, I think the thing he was proudest of was his use of the pen. Uh, as a former slave, writing about the meaning of slavery. And let me just run through quickly a, a sense of not just the achievements of his life, but reasons why he endures and he is useful to us today to revisit. Douglas became, in my view, of course, I'm leaving out all kinds of biographical elements of his life and the stages of his life, but he became really the prose poet of American democracy. If you're looking for a writer, a voice, in the various genres in which he wrote, who, who was trying to explain to us what a democracy really is, and my God, have you ever lived a time when you're hearing the word democracy used as much as it is now? I've never, I've lived a long time now, and, and I've never heard the word democracy so openly used. My goodness, 30, 40 years ago, if we walked around saying democracy is so much, we'd probably feel embarrassed. Douglas never stopped writing about, thinking about the deepest nature of democracy. If you're looking for someone to explain, uh, I've got a power lawnmower outside here, I apologize. Uh, anyway, uh, if you're looking for somebody to explain the meaning of slavery as a lived experience, as a physical experience, but even most importantly to Douglas as a mental experience. No one had more to say about that in more eloquence and through more powerful metaphors than did Douglas. I hope you can still hear me. <laughs> yes, uh, we can hear you. Fine. Okay, good. It's, okay. Because he, he comes close to my window every now and then, anyway. Um, I live in an apartment building where we hire this guy every two weeks. Sorry. But if you're also looking for someone to explain this idea of race, this American dilemma, this oldest American uh, problem that like a fever just never goes away and comes back. No one in the 19th century had more to say about what race is or what race could do in, in, the, in the polity and in civic life as much as Douglas did. Um, he also wrote 
It's okay, uh, David. You can, you can continue. It's all right. Yes. I can't hear myself, but that's all right. <laughs> he also wrote with what I like to call a kind of terrible honesty about American contradictions. Douglas was a firm believer in the American creeds. There are ways that he came by this. He was a great lover of the Declaration of Independence in its principles. It was the practices, of course, that he wrote such brilliant criticism of. His famous Fourth of July speech in 1852 is about as good an, an, a Jeremiadic analysis of American hypocrisy as you will ever read. But it doesn't mean he didn't love the first principles of the Declaration itself, and he did. Uh, above all else, Douglas was a believer in the natural rights tradition. And then it became a kind of an American wonder in the 19th century to see or to hear Douglas. And I speculate in the book, although no one can ever count these things, the more Americans heard Douglas speak than any other American of that century. He traveled constantly. He, he did annual long three and month lecture tours way into old age. He's still doing it uh, in the year before he died. Um, it became, and uh, there are many, many, many uh, newspaper descriptions and anecdotes, particularly out of that Evans collection, from people saying what he looked like, what he sounded like, the first time they saw Douglas, the second time they saw Douglas, and so on. And in that sense, Douglas developed a serious problem with the issue of fame, what we would call celebrity. They called fame. He, he lived both the pleasures and the great perils of the problem of fame. Um, He's also somebody, and this may be resonant with some of us, who, depending on when you look, both loved and hated his country. And by that, I simply mean uh, he could chastise with embittered metaphors and embittered language the the betrayals and violations and contradictions of the United States. But at the same time, he developed into, especially with the Civil War and emancipation and early reconstruction, he developed into a kind of radical patriot who had a, a sense of fierce honesty about what it actually meant to love one's country, to believe in its ideals. Uh, apart from practices. So, and there are many, many other elements of his life. I'll give you one other example. There's always been this issue in African-American history about the question on the one hand of self-reliance. How much should black people, former slaves, uh, at any stage, any time, engage in self-reliance, build their own communities, create their own alternative economies, create their own schools, HBCUs after the Civil War, and so on and so on and so on. Lift themselves up. Well, Douglas was a great proponent of that. A great proponent of that. As we all know, this issue's never gone away. But at the same time, he became a fierce proponent of activist, interventionist, government. He believed in using government as an active, powerful agent of social change. He believed that government was necessary, as it was, to end slavery. There, there'd be no end of slavery in this country without the Union Army and the Union Navy and presidential power. He believed in the use of government to, to free people, to defeat the Confederacy, to try to enact black civil and political rights and protect them, but at the same time argued for self-reliance. It never is one or the other. And in our politics, particularly today, in fact, there's a segment of the American right, the libertarian right, housed at the Cato Institute, 
that loves to appropriate Frederick Douglass. Uh, a book came out of the Cato Institute just two years ago called Self-Made Man, where they pick up on Douglass's support of self-reliance and self-help, and they argue that he didn't believe in government and that you know he was a limited government Republican. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I actually wrote an op-ed in the Times back then about that book. And I baited the author to respond, and he never did, anyway. Uh, and last but not least, and I've, I've left out many things here, but, but one of the reasons we're talking about Douglas is because of his, frankly, his use of the Bible and a biblical story and a biblical language and metaphor. I came to understand after years of working on him that one cannot understand this man without understanding how deeply steeped he was, especially in the Old Testament. Now, exactly what he was as a religious believer is another set of questions, and that undergoes changes in his life and are not always as easily discernible as how he actually used language. There is no Douglas speech, no major Douglas speech without very active uses, especially of the Hebrew prophets. His favorite was Isaiah. His second favorite was Jeremiah. He used the Psalms all the time and he invoked stories out of Genesis all the time. Now this is not uncommon in the 19th century, but to understand him, to understand his worldview, his overall sense of history, his use of language, where he gets these incredibly powerful metaphors in his, in his liquid consciousness, you have to see how much he is steeped in, in the prophets, especially of the Old Testament. So one of the biggest dilemmas I had in this book, and there are several others, was just getting comfortable putting that word prophet into the title and then being ready to defend it and explain it and so on. And I had a lot of help with that from because I don't I don't have formal theological training, although I've always been interested in it. But I had I have friends who are theologians, or two or three in particular, who really helped me and got me reading certain scholars on the Old Testament, like Walter Brueggemann, Robert Alter, and, and others, but especially Abraham Heschel. And I could come back to that if anybody wishes. But it became a way of finally not just cracking Doug, you know, some key to Douglas's secrets. They're not secrets, but he needs to be understood through that kind of biblical worldview that he draws from Exodus and, and other elements of the Old Testament. And, and then the metaphors he uses over and over and over again. He really believed that history happens because there are great breaks in history or history gets turned upside down and then may get a chance at a rebirth or a renewal of some kind. And of course, the American Civil War became just that for him. I'm not suggesting he had it all predicted and figured out. He didn't. Uh, and by the way, prophets are not people who predict. Prophets I learned from reading Heschel and many others are not people who predict things accurately or wrongly or whatever. They are the people, very few of them, who manage to find words in moments of crisis, moments of catastrophe, moments of triumph, to explain to us what we're experiencing that most of us cannot explain. That's what Douglas was and became. I'll leave you with his last line. When he's ending his long form masterpiece, or what I think is, 440 page second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855, a book he publishes right in the middle of the political crisis over slavery in the country, with the political parties tearing themselves apart, bleeding Kansas, little civil wars broken out out in Kansas, fugitive slaves are being rescued, uh, the country is in great turmoil. He plants that autobiography at that moment, and it too became a bestseller. But the last line of the book is, as long as, I, you know, as long as heaven allows me to do this work, 
He says, I will do it with my voice, my pen, and my vote. My voice, my pen, my vote. And in Douglas's case, his vote was very important to him. In fact, there's no greater voice about the power of the right to vote in the 19th century more than him. But he never had any political weapon. He never held an elective office. He never had any other political weapon than his voice and his pen. Which is all any of us have really, our voice, our pen and our vote. If we have great wealth, we might have other weapons, but most of us just have a voice and a vote and only some of us have the pen. <laughs> anyway, thank you. And I look forward to comments and questions of all sorts. Thank you, David. Uh, this is wonderful. I wish we could uh, give you a hand, but electronically we will. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, and we have about 25 minutes Good. for our floor discussion. And I will invite our uh, uh, friends in the audience to, uh, to uh, make either brief comments or ask questions. If there are comments, please keep them very brief because uh, chances are the number of people who want to ask questions from David is going, it's my phone, sorry. It's going to be very large. And please be considerate of others and not make long comments and uh, keep them brief and ask questions. So we can use uh, primarily raise your hand electronically on your uh, the screen so I can see who has raised the hand and call on you. Uh, you can enter your questions in chat and I'll try to monitor it, but I think uh, we, we can handle it with the hands. So uh, well, with that, uh, I'll give you a, a minute to uh, think about this, uh, uh, formulate your questions or comments. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, David, if I may ask about uh, the voice and pen and vote comment. That's, of course, it's a wonderful line. Mm. And uh, sometimes people have also talked about exit in addition to voice and vote and pen. That is a, I'm going to Canada solution. <laughs> Did, and I believe in earlier part of 20th century, there was some movement along those lines of going back to Africa. Uh, and uh, I, I take it we can call that an exit solution. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, I take it Douglas never talked about that. No, he, well, he talked about it, but always, almost always, as a critic, uh, there were two or three stages of black emigrationism in the 19th century. Well, there was the old colonization movement, which began way back in the teens, 18 teens, 1820s, which was a white run organization that was designed to try to voluntarily remove as many black Americans as possible, possibly back to Africa or to the Caribbean, or to Central America. And of course, the nation of Liberia was literally founded by American colonizationists in the 1820s. Uh, their capital uh, was first known as Monrovia for James Monroe, the president. Uh, Douglas hated colonization or emigration impulses among his own people because to him, and he got into some bitter debates over this by the late 1850s uh, within black leadership. To him, though, it was always a violation of what he considered the American birthright. Douglas never had any equivocation about the idea. <laughs> Just because you were born a slave in America didn't mean you weren't American. Uh, and people might not always like this conclusion, but he had actually very little interest in Africa. Uh, he had some interest in African history, but frankly, not much. He was very much an Anglophile. His interest tended toward European history and especially British history. 
and he had many, many deep associations with Britain, uh, the Irish, the Scottish, and the Brits, because he traveled there, visited there on three occasions. Um, but to Douglas, this <laughs> idea of removal just violated the idea of birthright. Now, the only time he ever flirted with it was on the eve of the Civil War, because after the Dred Scott decision, which many of you will know was this terrible Supreme Court decision, which essentially said in 1857 to black people, you have no future in America as citizens. You will never be citizens. And in the wake of that, for three years, from Dred Scott in 57 to the election of 1860 and the secession crisis, there were real emigration schemes afloat among black Americans. Martin Delaney ran one that he thought would end up moving people to Nigeria. Uh, Henry Harlan Garnett got involved with one um, that they hoped would remove people to parts of Africa, particularly to uh, Liberia. Uh, and then there was even a scheme, a serious scheme to, to, to allow people to go to Haiti or particularly an island off the, a smaller island off the coast of Haiti. Um, those never developed very large followings, but they were a serious source of real division within black communities. And Douglas got into some pretty bitter fights over that. But on the eve of the Civil War, he actually had booked passage on a steamer with his daughter, Rosetta, who by then was about 21 years old, because um, he was getting some pressure from his now nearly adult children who were pressuring him. Father, do we have any future here? These were young, young people wanting to know what kind of future do I have here? And he booked passage to go visit Haiti to check it out in April 1861. He was scheduled to leave about a week or two, I forget now, after the firing on Fort Sumter. And right after the firing on Fort Sumter, April 12, 1861, he wrote a little column in his newspaper that said, trip to Haiti, canceled. Because <laughs> <laughs> he saw in the outbreak of war now whole new possibilities. You'd have to wait for those. Um, so, you know, this, this idea of stay or remove has always been a conflict. Uh, for black Americans at different times in different places. And it had a big revival, as you suggested, Sham, in the late 19th century mm -hmm. and early 20th, first under um, Henry McNeil Turner and part of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and then especially uh, with Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, yeah. who was from Jamaica and had, had moved to the U.S. So, uh, you know, look, uh, it, it was a serious debate in black America. Uh, but Douglas always saw it as a essentially racist effort at its core to deny black Americans their essential birthrights as Americans. Okay. Uh, I'll read out the first question on the, from the chat. And yeah. I'll read there are a lot of from, them here. <laughs> yes, from Amy. What would uh, Frederick Douglass think about the racial issues in Baltimore today with all of the highly publicized riots about the police killing unarmed black men and other issues. Well, it used to be that historians could bat away counterfactual questions about what a historical person would think in the present and we could get away with it. But as I've learned the last couple of years, you can't now. So I've had to, I've had to practice what Douglas might've thought about a lot of things, <laughs> which of course we don't know. Uh, but I think it's safe to say Douglas would have been uh, saddened to say the least, appalled at the use of police forces, especially to harness uh, control of often poor black people. This would have, this would have outraged him, I think. Um, and for Baltimore, uh, when the Freddie Gray thing happened, God, is that three years ago now at least? Four years ago? When the Freddie Gray episode happened, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually back then wanted to write something about what Douglas might have thought, but I could never bring myself to figure out exactly what he would have thought, except that he would have joined the protest. He would have joined the outrage because Douglas always at the end of the day 
uh, was an advocate of social movement, of social, you know, of, of converting outrage and anger into legitimate protest. Because th this is one thing I, I can absolutely say about Douglas. He feared revolution. He feared insurrection, if you like, because nobody knew better than former slaves how slave rebellions and insurrections and violence would end up. It ended up in the death of the slaves. And riots in cities, even if people feel justified, uh, it's, it's easy to say, but it, there's, it's true. Uh, often destroy the very communities that are resisting what's being done to them. He would have, tr Douglas would try to find ways to harness outrage. It's what he did in his lifetime. Harness outrage, bitterness into social action, into voting, into legislation. I mean, that's not saying, that's not to say he was some kind of moderate. He wasn't a political moderate at all. But he saw the dangers that if you don't find a way through politics and through law to gain great change, you may have no other method than rebellion and revolution. And that is a desperate step. Now, it doesn't mean that in the 1850s, he didn't at times flirt, as he did with John Brown. Uh, he did, it doesn't mean he didn't flirt with those trying to plan some kind of rebellion. Uh, so, I mean, today Douglas would, I don't know, I, I can imagine Douglas is walking out among a lot of young people in the streets and saying, help me help you harness your rage. And he, if he could get their attention, he might tell them something about his own rage. Douglas walked out of slavery in 1838 with a tremendous rage in his heart. And it comes out in his work. It comes out in his writing. It comes out in his speaking. You can see it. You can feel it at times. And he had that great good luck of being this man of writing, this man of words who could process all that anger on the page. His anger is on the page. Now, not most people can't do that. I mean, Douglas, I, I think, would try to engage young people and he'd say, all right, how do we harness this rage? How do, how do we get hold of it? And I mean, I'm sure he'd be thrilled by what happened, not by the police violence, not by what's been happening with the death of black people in cities, but he would have been tremendously encouraged by the protest across the world. And now by the way, some of that protest got harnessed in voting. Uh, thank you, David. We have a question from Mary Elizabeth Lang, who worked yeah. on Douglas papers when they were still at Yale. And she wants to know, uh, she recalls a vivid description of his first meeting with Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. and wants to know if you remember where exactly it appeared. Well, hello, Mary Lang. I wonder if we met because if truth be told, did you work on the Douglas Papers when they were here at Yale? I guess you did. Yeah, you say that under John Blassingame. Well, I believe it or not, when I was a nobody, a lonely graduate student at Wisconsin in 1980, the first time I ever visited New Haven, I came here. I had made contact with the assistant editors, namely it was with Jason Silver, Silverman at the time, and they let me for two days into the project here, which was located over on Wall Street, or just off Wall Street. Uh, and I had lunch, I remember, at the old Naples. Blassingame wasn't in town. Anyway, long story there, but I actually got to, to engage the papers to a limited degree at that moment. And I don't know if I met you then. I, I have no memory of it. It's a long time ago. Um, that first encounter with with Lincoln was in August of 1863. Uh, they will meet three times, August of 63, August of 64, and then right after the second inaugural address in the East Room of the White House. Uh, that first encounter was when Douglas went to Washington, uninvited, and simply got in line 
and put his card through and they let him in. And Lincoln let him in and they had a first meeting which was a little contentious because the reason Douglas had gone at that point, context is everything here. Emancipation Proclamation was last January. The recruiting of black soldiers has been going on since March and April and Douglas has been leading that cause among others. But the brutal discriminations that were practiced against black soldiers at the front or even in the camps organizing them, including his own two sons, were the reason Douglas quit recruiting that summer in protest. And he went to Washington to complain to Lincoln's face about these discriminations. Black soldiers could never be officers. Black soldiers were, were given unequal pay, brutally unequal pay. They were given inferior weapons and so forth. Uh, they had an exchange. They had a good exchange, they said. Douglas came away saying, like in diplomatic language, they had a good uh, discussion of uh, exchange of views, but did not fully agree. Now, where that came from, Elizabeth or Mary, is really from life and times. It is from the third autobiography where he describes it. It also came out in speeches. Douglas started giving a speech after that, where he said to people, you know, I went to the White House, you know, I went down there and uh, he, he would turn it into humor. Douglas said, you know, I got in that line and I was the only black spot in that line. He, he would, you know, he, he, could, he could use race for humor. And, he, and then he said, you know, and then they even let me in. And then he would joke about how tall Lincoln was. This was in a speech, speech he gave in the fall of 1863. He said, you know, Lincoln had one foot in one corner of the room and one foot in the other corner of the room, but, but, he, but he listened to me. And then he came away saying, quote, I felt big there which sounds like a comment of a 12 year old, but it was Douglas saying, my God, I demanded to see the president and he talked to me. And Douglas in that same speech said, I'd never met a white man who treated me as such an, a white man in power who treated me as such an equal. He said, we didn't agree on everything, but he treated me as an equal, as a person. That's that first meeting. So what we know about it comes out in speeches and then he wrote about it in Life and Times later. He also wrote about it in a couple of letters. But I wonder if we met in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> you can respond with a, by un, uh, unmuting yourself, or Mary, if you like. Sorry. Okay, there's a question. Oh, I, don't, I don't oh. recall that, that we met. Okay, but, I don't need. Uh, but we, we knew all the same people there. <laughs> of course. Yes, indeed. Jack McKivigan, et cetera. Yep. Yes. They were all the assistant editors. You, you, were, you were an assistant editor on that project. I was a research assistant. There you go. Yeah. Well, the Douglas papers are still in, believe it or not, all these decades later are still in progress. They're still not finished. They're not located, as you probably know, in Indiana. Uh, anyway. Long story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. You There's bet. a question from Stephen Scher. Were there any other comparable figures during Douglas's period? Well, sure. I mean, among black leadership, yeah, he's hardly alone here in the pantheon of black abolitionists. There are the Henry Holland Garnets and the uh, Martin Delaney's and the James McCune Smith's and so on. And there are the Sojourner Truths. And then there's of course, Harriet Tubman who's of a di very different kind of leadership model. But there really was no one of this kind of literary power among the abolitionists. Um, and uh, Douglas was recognized as less. Although I will say your question leads me to one of the other elements of that Evans collection and the coverage of that last third of Douglas's life because in that last third of his life, he gets into all kinds of bitter rivalries with the next generation of black leadership, which is hardly uncommon. I mean, what does the next generation want to do with us? Well, they usually want to knock us off, especially if you've reached some pedestal. And Douglas liked his pedestal. He liked being, he liked being king of the hill. 
And uh, he was even referred to at times in the press without his name. He was sometimes just called Old Man Eloquent. And the next generation had some brilliant young leaders like T. Thomas Fortune, uh, like uh, uh, John Mercer Langston, who had gone to Oberlin College, who was born free, who became many things, uh, a lawyer, a congressman, a diplomat, or Richard T. Greener, who was the first black graduate of Harvard, who became dean of the Howard University Law School. All of these guys got into their fights with Douglas that were ideological and sometimes very personal. And the Evans Collection newspaper clippings revealed that as never before. And, and I learned in that just how hypersensitive Douglas was to criticism. He didn't take it well. And he often threw the mud back at his rivals worse than they threw it at him. <laughs> so yeah, there were many other, but none of them were quite the writer. William Wells Brown was close, uh, if you're looking for other names, who wrote a famous autobiography and he, he dabbled around with history and so on. But none of them left us a literary record quite like Douglas. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Kimberly Barrow. Uh, what was the most surprising or unexpected thing you personally learned about Douglas from your recent research? Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, many. <laughs> um, well, I just mentioned his hypersensitivity, this personality trait of his. I learned a lot more about this time through. And I was quite surprised at times how ugly these disputes became and how personal they became. Uh, that Douglas on the pedestal, that beautiful man in all those photographs had a, had a lot of rough side, rough edges. This was somebody, by the way, who he was very sensitive about slights, either about race, you know, that he didn't belong here or didn't belong there, or about his lack of education. And when he felt those slights, boy, watch out, don't get in the way. But I'll say that there are many elements in this research, because it took years and years, about his personal life that are at times quite surprising, revealing, fascinating uh, in their complexity. Uh, I won't go into it all, but... Um, this is a man who really struggled with his own sense of uh, how to hold it together. I think he had two fundamental emotional breakdowns, one in the early 1850s for a whole variety of reasons in that context, and one right after his wife Anna died in 1882 after 44 years of marriage a marriage that was complicated, at times difficult, but extremely important. Uh, he came apart when she died and he wandered off up to Maine to a place called Poland Springs, where we now, we carry around bottles of water from there now. Uh, he wandered off up there for about two months all by himself and happily wrote some priceless letters to his daughter while he was there. Um, but Douglas, in the course of this complicated, long life, had at least two major relationships with European women. Uh, one named Julia Griffiths from Britain uh, from the late 1840s to the mid-1850s. And then one over about a 22-year period with a German woman named Ottilia Ossing. Ossing is a long story and was one of the great enigmas in this book and for any Douglas scholar. She came to America, she was a brilliant German 48er, a German Jew, although not a practicing Jew. In fact, she was a, she was a vehement atheist and tried to convert Douglas unsuccessfully. But she, uh, she read Douglas's uh, second autobiography, Bondage and Freedom, and in 1856, went out to Rochester, New York, where Douglas lived, basically knocked on the door and asked for an interview. And then she tried in one way or another never to leave. Um, everything we know about that relationship, well, 99% of it comes only from her, her letters, her writings, especially her letters to her sister back in Europe, all of which I had translated by an intrepid, brilliant young 
German law student at the Yale Law School <laughs> named Katarina, Katarina Schmidt, whom I owe a lot to for translating all those Asing letters. And I was not the first to use the Asing letters by any means. Others had been there before. Um, but these were very complicated relationships about which he wrote nothing, nothing. In fact, the greatest dilemma of Douglas's autobiographical performance of 1200 pages of autobiography, he's one of the great autobiographers of American history, but there's almost nothing in any of them about his family life, about his private life, about his children, about his two marriages and certainly not about Julia Griffiths or Otilia Assing. They didn't write any kind of tell-all memoirs in the 19th century, but he steadfastly avoided all of that in writing about himself, and that's understandable. But it is incredibly frustrating to read 1,200 pages of this man's autobiography over and over, and there is one mention of his wife, Anna, and she is called my wife. She's not even named. Um, so he never writes really about his complicated but deeply loving relationships with his three sons and daughter. Nor did he ever really write much at all about the death of his 11 year old daughter in 1859 or 1860, Annie, uh, his wife's namesake. Nor did he ever really write anything down to speak of about the fact that Anna, the first wife of 44 years who built his home uh, remained a non-reader and writer. She remained illiterate all of her life, which was a source of difficulty and tension within that family at times. Uh, the, most, uh, the, most, the most brilliant African-American man of letters in the century was married to a woman he essentially did not share his intellectual life with. So there's a lot of elements of that where I kept finding surprises that would lead me down this path and that path without ever finding perfect answers, which is, is the art of biography. And hence, at times, you have to imagine your way at least a little bit into those worlds. Um, I also had other surprises, but I'll, you know, I'll spare you so we can get a few more questions. <laughs> uh Though our time is up, I think well, I'll ask you one last question uh, okay, sure. from Tom Whalen. Oh, yeah, and yeah. he wants to know about your uh, reaction to portrayal of Douglas in the Good Lord Bird show about John Brown. Well, I have not yet watched the film, but I read the book. I read James McBride's novel. Uh, and I know a lot about the film series. Uh, look, that's James McBride's Frederick Douglass. McBride is he's a brilliant writer. Uh, and I liked, I really liked one of his earlier books. But Good Lord Bird is a totally irreverent satire. It's, a, it's an irreverent send up of black history. I mean, I think McBride's target, at least in the book, was the earnestness we sometimes practice about African-American history and radicalism, whether it's John Brown or a Douglas. But as you know, if you're watching it, he, he, he made Douglas into a drunken womanizer and a child abuser. <laughs> so look, uh, I can see why some screenwriters and film people got intrigued by it because they probably thought, oh my God, here's this religious zealot of a John Brown. And here's this womanizing Douglas. Oh my God, what a movie. And you got some good actors in Ethan Hawke and uh, David Diggs. But, it, you know, it, it's senseless to ask what it's got to do with history because it doesn't have much of anything to do with history. So <laughs> that's my reaction. But I haven't watched it because the book kind of wore me down you know, after a while. And maybe I was getting a little self-protective of Douglas. I don't know. Um, so... I haven't seen it. That's the best I can offer you. <laughs> well, Enjoy uh, it for its entertainment, whatever. Well, we have uh, kept you five minutes longer, uh, oh, but sure. it's so fascinating, not only about learning about Frederick Douglass and his life, but also learning about what is a master historian. Thank you so much, David. Would you please join me in thanking David. 
and we'll put this uh, recording on the website. So it'll be available to the audience and others. And I uh, can thank you now. You're going well, to you know, something. and I saw somebody asked about that Beinecke program coming up on the Evans collection. You can easily find that through the Beinecke website, but I can also provide a link for it and send it uh, to, uh, to Marie and Sean. And you yeah, can put it we'll, on we'll mail it to the participants. Sure. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank enjoy you. Have a day out there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, Sean. Oh, thank you so much, David, for taking time. It, this was fascinating. It was fun. Uh, obviously, I'm not a historian, but uh, right. the, 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 the depth and richness of your understanding mm. is, and, uh, is, is so fascinating. No, I, I keep rehearsing it enough, so I can't forget I it. Had, I had read your edited book uh, earlier, this uh, 